It is with great pleasure to introduce you to Camille Bonino, the founder of AVER, Archive for Women, Artist, Research and Exhibition here in Paris. Please, Camille, could you tell us a bit about how you had the idea to fund this so important NGO or institution, better to say? So yes, uh, in a few words, I'm, I'm directing AWARE and I founded it with uh, six other women uh, in 2014. So we're celebrating our eighth anniversary this June. And I'm happy to celebrate it in a new space uh, in Villa Vassiliev, where I stand now. It used to be the studio of Marie Vassiliev in the 1920s but also a restaurant or a sort of cheap cantina where she invited artists between the two wars. So AWARE is really about sharing and producing information about women artists from the past, um, from the 19th century to women born in 1972. Today we have about 850 biographies on the website. Everything is bilingual. And we are also reaching out to a wider public recently during the confinement. Um, I created contents for children, for younger adults, and for um, anybody who is not a specialist in history of art, so they can learn about women artists from the past and a history that is mostly invisible today. Can you please tell us what made you decide to establish a better? Yes, so where came from um, a professional experience uh, which I had in Centre Pompidou. Uh, I curated Elle at Centre Pompidou in 2009, which was the first time a museum devoted the permanent collection to only women artists. So we literally pushed away the men artists from the collection to um, tell the story of the 20th century only with women artists. It was an important moment because at the time it was not obvious for everyone that there was more than maybe 15 artists in history. Most of the people can usually um, quote or maybe cite five names of women artists. In the case of Elle at Centre Pompidou, I showed 300 artists and about a thousand works from the collections. So I demonstrated that there were more to say and I also experienced myself personally, that these artists that I showed in the museum had very little information about them, very little books published, uh, very little um, com commentaries on the show. Uh, very few of them had been represented by galleries. Their market amounted to zero for most of them. So I just discovered this immense gap in history and I decided to create a few years after I left the Centre Pompidou and I created AWARE the non-profit, in order for my colleagues, um, historians or art historians or curators, to find the information that I had been lacking uh, in 2009 when I worked in Centre Pompidou. So it's really a tool um, designed for specialists and non-specialists so that nobody can say anymore that there were only a few important women artists. What are the methods of research you are applying? We use a very classical method of research, really. It's, uh, it's classical series art history. Um, it's a very collective work. We have about, I would say today, 300 people working uh, for free, most of them. For others who write, uh, we give them a fee. Um, they work all over the world. We have teams working in Africa, North America, South America, Asia. Um, they can work in museums or uh, in universities. Um, they really they want to participate. We have a web of specialists all around the world. So basically what we're doing is promoting research uh, on women artists. So the methods um, is um, collective research. And also we're reaching out to uh, specialists of women artists all over the world. Um, picking up uh, very young researchers, in some cases, a master's or PhD. So really, uh, we get um, the research where, where it starts, where it's really sprouting like, like a flower. Uh, so we have this really uh, like a web, an mm. international web, collecting information. And then we got the names and stories, and then we have a scientific committee. 
uh, an editorial committee. And then we have a lot more uh, geographical committees. For example, we have a special committee for Africa, a special committee for North America uh, and South America, a special committee for Israel, etc. So it's depending on the sponsors we have. But when we feel that our scientific committee is not precise enough, then we organize a specific scientific committee which chooses the artists and then chooses the, the authors of the text. Every text is signed. So it's the difference between AWARE and Wikipedia is that our texts are signed by the authors, uh, they're reread, they're editorialized, and of course published uh, in both languages, French and English. What are the exact criteria? I mean, you just mentioned that you have this web, this web and uh, international sort of uh, advisory. Um, but what are the criteria choosing an artist? Um, I get that question a lot. Um, I would say it's exactly the same as um, when a museum acquires a work or decides to show it. Uh, and awake, when I created L some time ago, I, I got that question a lot. People said, how do you choose the artist? They, Why do you ask me how I choose the artist when it's women and you didn't ask when it was only men? Um, so I, I used the, the usual criteria. It's, it's a collective decision. There's different levels. And in general, I say that the art historian works as a doctor. Uh, when you're sick, you get to a doctor and he says or she says, okay, you have that kind of illness. After checking you, it takes he or her maybe five to ten minutes. What an artist needs works exactly in the same way. It's about 10 to 15 years studying, then 10 to 50 years experience. So you can decide in a few minutes whether a work is interesting or not, or whether a patient is really sick or not. It's like two sides of the brain, I would say. Yes, of course, um, um, it's also intuition and knowledge, right? Yes, it's both, exactly. It's both a mix of intuition and knowledge, same as a doctor looks at you and, and gets a lot of information, of the, the, you know, your skin, your eyes, and the way you talk, and then he's going to, you know, take your pulse, etc. Artistian works the same. It's a lot of knowledge on the side and then the information you get visually from the work and what the sensation it gives you. And our scientific committee are made of art historians, collectors, museum directors, uh, art critics, and they all discuss and sometimes they don't agree and from the disagreement comes the good decisions, exactly as um, museum committees where curators don't agree and somehow they have a small budget, so they have to make the good decision within the small budget to buy such and such works, it's the same thing. Exactly. And also I think it's important when the work um, was done, in what period, what time, and what the time, is it innovative, was it innovative, was it rather not? I mean, this issue, so it's a lot of work, I can see that. Yes, and maybe it's a good, in, in the sense your question is interesting because actually I said we use the classical method of an art historian. It's not completely true. For women, it's really difficult to find information. So somehow you have to dig deeper. You have to um, uh, recreate the narrative uh, for lives which are most of the time disrupted. It's not continuous careers because it's been difficult for women. At some point they had to stop, take care of children, didn't have a gallery, so have to have another job. So their career is different from men's career and or even if it's the same, the archives of the work is really difficult to find. So we have to find uh, really uh, involved art historians, more patient, uh, more tenacious um, because it's like a little bit like um, a crime uh, history. I mean, you have to find traces, um, bits and bits of things, and recreate uh, the career and go for the private collection, go to the family, go to the estate. As um, for men, uh, it's really easy. 
I mean, take Picasso, you've got like 50 monographies. It's really easy to find any kind of information. A woman artist from the 1920s or 30s, it takes, I would say, 10 to 15 more effort to find information. So the kind of uh, work is a little bit different in that sense. Thank you. And um, as I understand, you do also exhibitions. Um, are you working in big institutions or is it? Well, AWARE as a collective has been invited recently um, to create walkthrough in art fairs. We started with Art Paris in Paris, I would say three, four years ago. Then we were invited by the Armory Show in New York to create a walkthrough and to create a prize. Um, and of course the walkthrough were women artists and in the fair that we chose and uh, there was an audio guide who could take a visitor through the walkthrough. So to, just to make an art fair more interesting. And more recently we've been invited to create the section Spotlight in Freeze Masters in London. So we're really happy to, to be doing that, like right now. Um, so we have a good list of um, mix of historical and more recent artists, which I cannot disclose yet, but I hope you can see it in London next, next October. But this is not selling artists, do I understand it right? Or is it also selling? I mean, Oh yes, yes, it's, it's galleries. Yeah, we picked up galleries uh, representing. Uh, we picked up the artists and the galleries both. I mean, we tried to have an interesting selection with well-known galleries and lesser-known galleries. And please, could you tell us a bit more about the Loria? Um, is it yearly, and uh, what is it? Oh, the, the 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 Aware Prize. Yes. Yes. So it's a prize that has been created uh, really from the start in two thousand fourteen. At the time, um, I had made some kind of statistics about prizes in general. And as you probably know, at least at that time, uh, most of the prizes in every category, science, art, etc., were given to men. Um, so that has changed a lot, but at the time it was really a men's thing. So I decided to create a prize only for women artists, actually two prizes. One for um, confirmed artists called Prix d'honneur. And one, and one for an emerging artist called Pre-Aware. Confirmed artists got 10,000 euros and um, a book, and the younger artist got um, an acquisition and an exhibition. Now, recently, I had to admit that most of the prizes um, corrected themselves in a way and are much more equal uh, in terms of uh, the ratio of gender. So we decided to change the second prize into what we call now Prix Nouveau Regard. And um, this second prize is uh, addressing mid-career artists uh, because women, women artists somehow get a recognition but never international enough. So we're giving that prize to women artists who can then have a scholarship to go to the States. And we have a nice partnership with Villa Albertine in New York. So they get the money to have the scholarship and they can stay in New York and get contacts with galleries, museums, etc. So this price is really part of our practice from the start. And we have, um, like you, a line of books um, called Entretien. Um, and they are given to the prix d'honneur and they are bilingual. So we have um, interviews with the artists who got the prix d'honneur hearing about their life, their work, so this very special book, I'll give you a few of them. How do you see um, the future of your organization? Hmm, good question. Well, as you can see behind me, we have about uh, 3,000 3, books, so I would like to have a bigger library, because it's not over yet, There's lots of books are missing. That space will be a space for symposiums, uh, for meetings. Um, I hope, I would love to expand um, the action of AWARE to uh, other types of art than just sculpture, painting, video and photography. Uh, for example, applied art is something that is really interesting. Or why not music? Why not movies or cinema? And also to make AWARE more international 
uh, we are not so um, informed on Asia, for example. Um, some continents, some countries are not well represented. And I would also love to uh, go back into um, the past, uh, working uh, deeper into the 19th century, why not the 18th century, uh, why not the 16th or 17th century. Um, I think the more future expands, the more books are published and the more knowledge is created about women artists from the past. So we would love to have that on the website and, and share it to a wider audience. We have today about 60,000 to 70,000 visitors per month and I would love that audience to also grow. I would like to ask you how do you found financing your projects and aware as such? Um, aware is a, is a private initiative, it's a non-profit uh, so that um, the people who support us uh, get tax deduction, either private or corporation. Uh, the French state, the city of Paris, are also part of the finance, but they're a small amount, small proportion, so it's very private. Um, I started with a group of friends, really, and then uh, I was supported for many years by Chanel as the main sponsor. But today we have also the Champagne Veuve Clicquot, uh, we have a uh, Fondation NG. Um, we have other corporation, uh, you know, interested by the by the project. Cartier has recently joined uh, to work on Japan at a very specific geographical project. So we're bringing more and more people, and sometimes people uh, come with us with a project in their head, and we decide whether it's a good project or not. And uh, we love doing that, working together with the sponsors and defining the, what are their interests and how we can help them and how they can help Aware to, to grow. There must be a constant struggle, nevertheless. It is a constant struggle. And for an art historian like me, um, looking out for money is being interesting, uh, rewarding, but sometimes, yeah, sometimes I just don't feel like it, but I have to do it anyway. <laughs> As you know. The last question, maybe. And this vision, the finance we should put before the vision and the future. Okay. But the, the last question would okay. be um, what is your unrealized project besides growing? Unrealized project. Um, well, to go back to your subject, matter and memory, um, in terms of the woman artist, um, what we have now on the website and what most of the exhibitions show is really monographies and a life and work on one person. What I think is missing for women artists and what men artists have is that the, a man artist is also all, always more or less linked to a movement, to an avant-garde, uh, part of minimalist art movement, conceptual art, etc. Most of the women artists are unlinked. They like um, atoms uh, floating in the air. So what I would like to realize is to get all these women artists into the main narrative, put them back into um, cubist movement, into um, minimalism, into conceptual art, into every avant-garde, every style, every movement, because they've been part of these historical movements. Most of them have been famous during their lifetimes, and they were part of the groups within, with the men, and the history have forgotten all about them. So my bigger project would be uh, to add a layer of theory into the project, so that these movements, um, all today defined by men, like pop art, for example, will be in the future defined by men and women equally. Very interesting. And also, you are here in the Villa Vassiliev, and um, Marie Vassiliev, who had the studio here, who founded the Russian, um, what was it called, the, the Russian uh, here, I mean, Institute? No, not the Institute. The um, she had, yes, she had a school. She was actually... The Russian uh, school. Yes, she, she was a teacher in the school. She had a very interesting life. Very generous woman. 
And she was in the group of Matisse and uh, of all these artists. She was affiliated more to Cubism, but um, she was also directing the costumes and decor of Ballet Suédois, uh, which was like the uh, competitors of Ballet Russe. She was a very well-known woman at the time. She was also, so she was artist, painter, um, costume designer, theater designer, um, had, an, uh, had a school, run a school. She also here in that place um, had a restaurant for artists. So she has a multiple amazing life. And how can she, she had been forgotten. It's, for me it's like amazing, but really character, characteristic of uh, life of women artists. Thank you. I think, I think it's a good conclusion. Uh, it's very good. <laughs> I think it's good. Yeah, really good question. Can we, can we, um, well, it was Matisse. I think she had um, an encounter. She knew Matisse. Yes, yes, you're right. She met Matisse. Actually, I... I and he was a teacher, even in her yes, school. Yes, yes, absolutely. No, no, yes. She met him. Um, she, uh, he taught her at some point or they had a wonderful meeting and she talks about it at the radio. I, had, I have a podcast, I created a series of podcasts and I introduce her and you can hear her voice uh, de describing her encounter with Matisse. And it's really interesting because she says, uh, this man with a beard, with beautiful blue eyes, was uh, really nice to me. And so she's like really nice about it. And you can see the difference, I would say, between Matisse and Léger and Bourdel, where all male teachers, but really open to women, bringing them in, teaching them the art, treating them like equal. And uh, someone like Picasso was like a little bit less uh, nice with women, I would say. So it's interesting also to keep in mind that some of these men artists were really um, quite nice to the women artists of that time. This is too important. I think you should repeat that. Okay, yes. which part? I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, no, this is very okay. important. I mean, why do you think male um, artists or um, artists art? done by men or more valid usually than women art? Well, the rule applied to women in art is the same as in every other sector, like in science or politics. They've been forgotten in general. And the artists, all the same. Um, so, uh, although they were quite well known while they were living, so this really uh, unfair. So what we have to do is, again, creating a fair archive so that history is written differently and women artists get the same level of information as men artists. Thank you so much. 